my pleasure to welcome all, you, all of you to today's lecture, which is featuring Ms. Sherilyn Landon. And just a few words about Sherilyn. She is the, well, she was a props master at UNC Chapel Hill. She's active in costume and cosplay, and she's also a puppet builder, as you will see shortly. She's also been involved with several Hollywood productions, including Dinosaurs, Mother Christmas Carol, The Patriot, Leatherheads, and most recently, Homeland and The Hunger Games. So she was also involved with Paramount Interactive with the Star Trek The Experience that was out in Las Vegas. So she, let's see, she also has been involved with Dragon Con, and she is a founding member of the 501st here in North Carolina. So she's got the street cred, so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear from her, Sharon the Lambert. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today talking about costumes, especially this time of year at Halloween. It's uh, very, very popular. And uh, Christian and I have been talking you know, for the past few weeks about the, uh, the presentation. I'm curious to know how many are, are in the convention scene? How many are familiar with convention costuming and cosplay? And Okay, so almost uh, most people. Uh, so I wasn't entirely certain how to gear my presentation, you know, just basically costumes or conventions, so I figured I would talk a little bit about both. But uh, since this is costuming and cosplay, I thought I might start out a little bit and talk about both of those terms because many of my fellow costumers and I have a lot of discussions about this. Uh, we basically see cosplay as where you're costuming to portray a character. You're, you're interested in the character and you're involved in the character and you work to portray that character. Costuming is you're interested in the process. You're interested in what it takes to build a costume and the technology that goes into it. So we kind of use define those two terms a little differently than most people or uh, as many people outside the costuming world r would. But uh, as I go, I am, and I brought plenty of things to talk about and to show and tell. If anyone has questions as we go, please, please feel free to ask me. I'm always happy to talk about things or, or explain things to people. And I, I like to make sure that people are hearing things that they're interested in. So I can start off a little bit by some of the things that I've done and show some of the props and costumes I've worked on. One of the most fascinating things I learned when I first started working in Hollywood, so to speak, or in the film industry, was that the pros do things exactly the same way that fans do. Of course, they've got more re resources, more equipment, more technology, uh, more people to work on things, but basically, we have a budget, we have a deadline, and we often try to create things as inexpensively and as quickly as we can. Uh, I can give you a good example, though, of many times where we have many different costumes for one character. Usually one character in a movie will have five or six different versions of the same outfit. Batman, for instance, is a good example of that. In the first Batman movie with Michael Keaton, he had five or six different versions of that same costume. He had one version that he could stand in, one version that he sat in, one version that he ran in, one version that you saw from the front, one version that you saw from the back. And on film, it all looked like the same costume but it's several different versions because it only has to look good on film from one side. And that's the main difference between Hollywood costuming and cosplay or convention costuming is you have to make it look good from all sides. And you also have to make sure you can walk in it, you can sit in it, you can eat in it, and most importantly, you can go to the bathroom in it. <laughs> there have been quite a few times where I've been in a large costume where my friends will help me in and they'll be like, great, see ya, like, hey, come back. Help me. So you have to make sure that when you're building a costume for yourself, whether it's a fun costume for Halloween or for a convention, that it's, it's practical, that it's usable. But uh, going back to what I said about fan or pros doing the same thing as fans, I'll pull up one item that I worked or helped build. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the TV show Star Trek The Next Generation? Okay. Yeah, many of you. There's a character, let me see if this will come up. There's a character in there called the Borg that you may be familiar with. Oh, please come up. And the Borg costumes were created from a process called cold foam latex by Michael Westmore. He was one of the main uh, makeup folks and latex folks in Hollywood and still is. Okay, it might be coming up. When I was at uh, Paramount in Charlotte, we had headquarters in Charlotte, we were responsible for building several of the Borg costumes for the parks, for Star Trek The Experience, or for our touring show called the Star Trek Landing Party. And we got many of the basic board pieces from Michael Westmore and his staff that we had to build onto. Now they sent us the basic latex pieces, we had to cut them out, put them together, add all the little doodads and everything. And one of the interesting things we found, if my 
laptop will cooperate, is that uh, they use pretty much anything they can find. There's a term in prop building called kit bashing. I don't know if you may all be familiar with that, where people will go out, they'll buy, say, a model plane kit or a model truck kit, and then build other things from that using parts and pieces from the kit. The Millennium Falcon, for instance, was built much in that way from kit bashing. And we found on the Borg here, let's see if this picture will come up, that uh, some of the things they used to make these Borg costumes and all the doodads and everything were uh, not quite what we expected. Let's see. Sorry, this is an older laptop. It's taking it a while to, to cooperate. It'll come up. Yeah. Well, I can, I can tell you that uh, some of the parts and pieces they used on those kits were actually Star Wars action figures. <laughs> when we were looking at the, the Borg pieces, we found that one of the little doodads was, in fact, a tiny R2-D2 action figure. So it was interesting to see that, okay, the Star Trek guys like Star Wars too. There it goes. I might pull it up here in a minute. We also used a variety of things you wouldn't necessarily think, like buttons, plain buttons. We used automotive tubing. We used the clips that would hold the automotive tubing. And basically, there we go. If you look very closely, there he is. There's R2. <laughs> right there. And on the other side, I don't have a photo of it, but on the other side of that head is a, uh, one of the little spaceships that had been in a Star Wars kit. So as you can see, they would use all sorts of things. But here we have the automotive tubing. We have the clips for it. You know, there are some buttons on there. So basically, we would build things out of whatever we could find at hand. Um, for instance, in the original Star Trek series back in the 60s, if you've ever seen their phasers, the guns that they used, the very tips of the phasers that they had were the lids from ketchup and mustard bottles. They would put those on there and just paint them to, to look space-like. So again, the pros will do things exactly the same way that we as fans do. Now, there are other techniques, of course, that are used in costume building that professionals can do a little better than we can at home because simply because they have the technology for it. Vacuum forming is one of those. If you're familiar with vacuum forming, how to do plastic pieces, and, uh, and I'll be glad to pass this is around. This is a piece of my Stormtrooper armor from Star Wars, and it's made of ABS plastic. You can see it's... it's um, fairly sturdy and it's heat molded. The way a vacuum formed piece is made is there's a positive mold for it. You take your sheet of plastic, melt it, and then place it over your positive, and there's a vacuum underneath that just <laughs> sucks it right over the mold. And that's how vacuum formed pieces are made. The Stormtrooper helmet here is made the same way out of a different type of plastic called styrene. But the technique is similar. It's uh, heat molded and then vacuum formed over the positive piece. And I'll be glad to pass these around if people would like to see them. And don't worry about dropping these or anything. You can't hurt them. They, they have been through a lot. But that's how much of the armor is made that you see in film and TV. It's very lightweight. It's very durable. Uh, many times you can paint over it, and you can use that to create the illusion of metal or leather or another type of item, especially on film. It's getting harder and harder these days to get away with a lot of cheating because of high-definition film and television. You can see more and more details as uh, technology gets better, and so it's a little harder to cheat these days than it used to be. If anyone's familiar with the Star Trek episode from back in the day, uh, The Trouble with Tribbles, and then they merged that with a more modern Voyager episode called Trials and Tribulations, Th when they went to use the original film footage and cleaned it up, they were able to see a lot more flaws in the costumes, props, sets, what have you, than they could originally see. So they had to do a lot of cleaning up and a lot of computer work on it to be able to mesh those two and make them look right together. So that's one technique of making armor, and I'll be glad to show another one. This is a combination of techniques. Years ago, I did a costume from Lord of the Rings, from one of the, one of the ring wraiths. And they had this awesome armor that they would wear. And this was how I recreated it. As you can see, it looks like a great metal gauntlet. But what it actually is, is this is a plastic piece from a child's knight's playset. It was a plastic child's gauntlet, and I have really teeny tiny hands, so I was able to make that work. And I'll be glad to pass this around, too. The plates here on the fingers, these are actually leather. They're cut out of leather. They are painted 
to look more metallic, and then they're actually stitched onto a glove backing. So they're articulated. They have this really great articulated look, but they won't hurt anyone. And it's very flexible and very lightweight. And again, I'll be glad to pass this around. For, for the actual movies, they used uh, much more uh, um, hard materials, more plastics, more resins. Uh, they did use a lot of leather. And in fact, we used a lot of leather on the Klingon costumes at Paramount. I'm going to tell you that. to make It was painted to look like the metal, but since it was up close to so many people, we wanted to use something soft that wasn't going to hurt anybody if they brushed up against it. So yeah, they used a variety of different things. And again, they have... They had a huge workshop with thousands of people working in there and a much bigger budget than I do. So, but uh, it's continuing on with armor, and I'll, uh, I'll pick this up because it goes along with my Stormtrooper piece that I had there. Way, way, way back in the day, when the 501st was first started and we didn't have vacuum-formed armor pieces, I was trying to create my own Stormtrooper costume to get wear to one of the movie premieres when the special editions came out back in 1997. And so I kind of concocted something out of foam core, uh, craft foam, and basically any other types of materials, lightweight materials I could find, and was able to construct this knee plate that looks very similar to the vacuum form piece that's, that's been going around. Now, this was my test model. Uh, when I finally did finish the armor pieces, I actually coated it with just white craft glue. These days, there's a fabulous material called Pepakura, if anyone has ever heard of that or worked with that, that you can use to coat cardboard, paper, uh, other lightweight materials like this and make it very sturdy and durable and it's a fabulous fabulous product so nowadays you can actually create paper props or uh, cardboard props and coat them with the pepacora and use them as actual armor or vacuum worn pieces and I'll pass this around yes uh, p-e-p-k-u-r-a pepacura now if I can get my laptop to coordinate again, or to cooperate. You know, I was going to show another technique. We used another item that's often used in armor making is fiberglass. Uh, many people use like boat kits to make fiberglass, but it's a lot more toxic to work with. It's got a resin that's very um, smelly, for one thing. As I said, very toxic. But you use the, the piper glass sheets. They're actually fabric sheets that you would cut, lay in your mold, and then coat with the resin. So that's also used to form um, armor material. Let me see if I can pull that piece up and show you how that technique is done. There we go. And while that's doing that, I'll con I can continue on with some armor pieces. In the same vein, um, this is another cardboard piece. This is actually poster board covered with craft foam and then coated with the glue and painted. This was a uh, Roman centurion arm piece that I made for Halloween a few years ago. And it's a little more sturdy. I actually folded the poster board over a cardboard tube and then coated it with the glue to hold it in place and then glued the, the piece on top of it and painted it. So again, I'll be glad to pass this around too. Now, as we're seeing, I'm actually curious to know what's your mask made out of? Mm -hmm. Some velcro. <laughs> what are the horns made out of? They're resin. Did you cast that yourself? Okay. Hold it together. That looks great. How's it? Is it attached to your wig or is it just. That looks great. Oh, nope. Oh, wrong one. Uh, go. So, oh, actually, here is the ring wraith I was going to show you. 
Now with my ring wraith costume, it's actually a combination, we were talking about puppets earlier. It's kind of hard to s tell in this picture, but on the ring wraith, it's actually on a horse puppet that I created with fake, I have fake legs hanging off the side. My own legs are underneath the puppet and I'm standing on stilts. And in fact, they're not actually stilts, but they, I use trash cans, plastic trash cans to stand on, which adds the height and also gave me the, the unexpected but awesome side effect of when I walked on a hardwood floor or, or a concrete floor, it made this great clip clop noise that sounded like a horse walking across the, a, a, the ground. But uh, the horse is actually built out of cardboard. The head is constructed out of cardboard. It's covered with fur. And I used red bicycle reflectors for the eyes so that when somebody took a flash photo of it, the eyes would glow red in the photo. So it's a combination of very cheap tricks, but they're very effective. Yes. Actually, the horse only took about a weekend to put together. I, uh, I originally built the horse for a production of Sleepy Hollow that was at one of the local community theaters. And so again, cheap materials, whatever I had to hand. And uh, I completely cheated at the horse's mane are actually made out of old Klingon wigs that we were getting rid of at Paramount. And uh, so I was able to salvage those, dumpster diving, so to speak, and use those for the horse's mane. And they used that in the production of Sleepy Hollow. And I've had that puppet for about 15 years now. And he's actually held together very well. He's been the, a ring wraith horse. He's been the headless horseman's horse. I turned him into a Thestral for a Harry Potter party once. So uh, he's, he's definitely earned his keep. But then as you can see, I have a, um, my hood over and a puppeteer mask underneath so that you can't see my face. And it's a very, very effective costume. I wore it at Dragon Con this past year and uh, with the new Hobbit movie coming out, it went over very well. The ring wreath took, actually took longer than you would have thought because as in the movie, there's about 50 yards of fabric in that costume. And there were about 50 yards in the ones in the movie. Once I started doing the research on it, you can't really see all the parts and pieces there, but the wraith costume, they've got an underskirt, which is very full. Then they have the over robe, which is also full. And then there's the cape, again, very full, and the hood, which is a separate piece, the head and then a capelet over the hood. So yes, as with the movie, there's about 50 yards of fabric in that costume. But uh, as you can see, it was very effective. And luckily, it wasn't very very finished, you know, it's supposed to look dark and dirty and something out of a grave, so I didn't have to finish my hymns. I was able to leave some ragged seams, and it was a very effective look. There's a pattern out, and this really just goes into the, one of the other things I was going to tell you about. There's a pattern out for the ring wraith, which I don't think I have with me, but in terms of creating costumes, more and more these days, Simplicity and the other pattern companies are coming up with some really great knockoff patterns for some of your favorite movie costumes. A few years back, well, sometimes they actually get the license, as when years ago they did the Star Trek Next Generation costume pattern, and sometimes you can still find these on eBay. This was their Shakespeare in Love pattern costume knockoff. It's a uh, kind of recreation of the one Gwyneth Paltrow wore, and it always am amuses me that when you look at some of these patterns, the models they pick for the costumes kind of look like the performer that uh, it's supposed to be copying. So that's how you can tell that this is what that was from. Of course, their knockoff Star Wars costume, which is pretty obvious <laughs> what that's supposed to be. And then a few years ago, of course, Xena Warrior Princess was very popular, and that was their Xena knockoff. So many of the pattern companies are really getting into some good costuming patterns, more so than they used to. And uh, I believe it's either McCall's or Simplicity's that has a really great line of historical costuming patterns. They've got some very accurate patterns that we've used a lot in theater. Me personally, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. They do have pattern makers in theater and in film who can create custom patterns, but if I can find something that looks close and then modify it, I will generally do that. It's much easier and much more efficient. You can, for instance, say, use a sleeve pattern from this costume or a skirt pattern from another costume and combine them to make the type of costume you're looking for. And so it's uh, uh, much easier to do that for me than to try to recreate an actual costume piece. But, and before I continue, any other questions? It's about working on anything in particular they're trying to find things for. As I said, I like to be able to, to talk with people about what they're really interested in. No? Well, I can talk about puppets as well. I'll pull some of my puppets up. Let's see. Like 
this one, this guy, for instance. And this is technically more a mascot than a puppet program, but this is obviously Marvin the Martian. He's one of my favorite costume characters, and I made him for Halloween a few years ago. And he's made out of a foam that's similar to the craft foam that was on the, the armor piece there. Uh, it obviously, it's called craft foam at Michael's and the Hobby Lobby. It's also referred to in the industry as EVA foam, ethyl vinyl acetate foam. If you're interested, you can get it at a company called uh, The Foam Factory. And it comes in the little thin widths that you can get at craft stores on up to one inch thick. It's a closed cell mini foam, and it's heat moldable. You can cut it and use a heat gun to, to mold it with uh, over an item. Or you can also glue it together with hot glue or a contact cement. So Marvin's skirt there is made out of the EVA foam, as are his shoes and his helmet, and it's all covered with fabric. And I see through the eyes. The eyes are made out of white mesh that I can see through with the, the black eyeball on top of it. And uh, Marvin has also earned his keep. He's won me several costume contests. Oh, here's one of the pieces I was going to show you, the vacuum form. This is also something from Star Trek. This is the breastplate that the female Klingons will wear. And here's another interesting side note. Hollywood reuses a lot of things, too. I don't know if you're familiar with this character. This was one of the Duras sisters from Star Trek The Next Generation. Well, if you see her breastplate there, this is also the one we used for Paramount Interactive. But before it was in Star Trek, it was in He-Man and the Masters of the Universe on Evil Lynn. It's the exact same chest plate there. And I also recently discovered, if anyone ever saw the brief live action TV series, The Tick, it was used on one of the background characters in that too. So things are constantly reused in Hollywood. If you look close, you may see some costumes being used again and again. Oh, and here's our Klingon. These are all cast pieces, just to show you some of the, give you an ex idea of some of the items that we work with. That's all leather there. His sash is actually made out of floor matting. We would use floor matting to do a lot of the, uh, the armor pieces. And these, these little insignia pieces, are made out of something called thermal plastic or friendly plastic. You, you may be familiar with that as well. It's a great item to work with. It's heat moldable. The only problem with friendly plastic is it will melt in a hot car. So if you're not careful, you can melt in, in pretty low temperatures. And also, it'll melt if you throw it in a dryer, as one of our Klingon's wives discovered when she tried to wash his costume. She took his fur tunic, washed it, threw it in the dryer without taking the insignia off, and it melted all over the costume and her dryer, and we had to build him a new one. So if you ever do work with friendly plastic, don't heat it. Let's see. Oh, here's the, um, I was going to show you a little bit of the, technique used in making some of that armor. The cardboard just stretched right over the tube and glued to get that curve. There's the pre-painted item with the cardboard and the craft foam on top. And then the finished armor, which actually looks pretty good to be cardboard and craft foam and glue. And, oh yeah, there's another picture of the ring wraith so you can get a better idea of the horse and the, the fake legs hanging off and how much fabric was in the costume. And one of my other favorite ways of costuming is thrift store costuming. I love going to thrift stores and trying to find things that will work for costumes. I heard somebody talking about the Ford Prefect picture earlier. If anyone's familiar with The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that was one of my favorite TV shows or programs back in the day. And there's a picture of the character, Ford Prefect, from the show. And this was a jacket and vest that a friend of mine and I just stumbled on in a thrift store not too long ago. And it was perfect. I mean, it's not exact as you can see, but it definitely gets the idea across. And I have been able to throw together some pretty good costumes just from thrift store finds. From a thrift store? Yeah, it's a, they're amazing. For instance, this is my Marty McFly from Back to the Future. And pretty much all of that is uh, thrift store, stuff I found at thrift stores. Now, I did add the, the proper fabric to the inside of the jacket lining there, but pretty much everything else I was able to find at a thrift store, and it came together pretty well. Unlike, let's see, my Harry Potter, 
which I um, put to, which I had to make completely from scratch. And a friend of mine put together that fabulous broom that you see there. But uh, as you can see, everything there is custom made. We, we researched the patterns, we researched the colors, and uh, you could buy the proper patches from a company, if anyone's interested, called patchgeeks.com. They do all sorts of patches, all sorts of insignia for any of your, your TV or movie programs. Uh, a friend of mine hand knitted that sweater for me, and I've created all the Quidditch padding there myself. So that's, that's a far cry from the thrift store costuming. That was something that we actually put a lot of time and work and research into. And I, I guess that would probably go more along the lines of cosplay than just plain costuming. We also did some friends of mine and I did some Harry Potter costuming. And uh, for any other Harry Potter fans, Whimsic Alley is one of the best places to get some of your sweaters, your ties, and uh, other school uniform needs, although unfortunately they're getting ready to be put out of business by Warner Brothers from what I understand. So if you're wanting to get something from Winsick Alley, go quickly. But those are some of the main costuming. Oh, I was going to talk about that too. My Jane hat from Firefly. <laughs> I, uh, I actually loom knit that and if anyone's familiar with loom knitting, I highly recommend it over a regular knitting in terms of making these hats because it goes very quickly. It's uh, a round loom that you basically just wrap your yarn around and uh, loop right over and you can make those hats in just a few, like half an hour, I can throw together a Jane hat. Let's see. Pull up some other puppet. Oh. Dang it. Oh yes, the Klingon breastplate we were looking at earlier. That one was cut made out of fiberglass. This is a similar breastplate constructed out of a plastic paint bucket. I have seen some really amazing armor made out of paint buckets, uh, trash cans. You can cut the plastic pieces out, glue them together. These are strips of, again, the thin craft foam, basically woven together and covered over with white craft glue, and then painted to look metallic. And uh, it, it's a very effective way to create armor. Pull up some there. Better picture the ring wraith gauntlets. And some of the puppet work. Is anyone familiar with Avenue Q? Yeah, you might recognize some of these guys. Trekkie Monster. There he is. Now puppets are also made out of foam. They're created from the EVA foam I was talking about earlier and also created from polyfoam, which is a type of upholstery foam that you can get even that at Hancock's and Joanne Fabrics and also from the foam factory that I was telling you about. And that comes in a variety of thicknesses and widths. And let's see. Some more of the armor. And here's a, the, I can show you the full length costume I did, my Spartan, <laughs> for Halloween a few years ago. <laughs> I once saw at Dragon Con a couple of girls who had the, the, uh, the muscle t-shirts and had the armor, and I thought, I can go better than that. So I went and got one of the fake chests from Target and created the armor to go with it and went as a Spartan myself a few years ago. I know all those guys who do the Spartan costumes are working out so hard, and I never understand why I got my chest for $12 at Target. Doctor Who, and Doctor Who was a combination of patterning and thrift store. I actually made this costume because I just happened to find that vest at a thrift store and thought, wow, that's perfect. The coat there is actually made out of a lab coat that I found at a thrift store. It's dyed the proper color, and I added the trim and buttons to go with it. Uh, the pants are made out of curtain fabric that I found at Walmart, and a friend of mine made the celery for me. So that's a good combination costume of thrift store and pattern making. Oh, and this one just for fun, since it is Halloween. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Ghostbusters is getting to be more and more popular, I've found, too. And there are, there's a website called GB Fans, or a forum called GB Fans. If anyone's interested in finding Ghostbuster items, that's the place to go. 
But uh, the proton packs are made out of vacuform and a combination of wood and found items, as you can see here. It's a vacuform plastic shell, and then it's got all the, uh, the accessories added on top. And the gun. Now here was one of the professional costumes I worked on for Children's Theater of Charlotte. This was a pirate for the, uh, the play How He Became a Pirate. And instead of giving him a peg leg, they gave him a steampunk leg, which was made out of leather, or buckram covered with leather, and it had all of these items attached to it. It had tacks and watches and also, you know, all sorts of filigree items added on, and then a spoon that he pulled out and did a sword fight with throughout the show. <laughs> so it was a neat little twist on it. Having, instead of having a peg leg, he had a steampunk leg. And again, as I'm going on, if folks have questions about any of these costumes, any costumes you're working on, or, or anything in particular, oh, there's the horse. I can show you the base of the horse. There's Inky. You can see, <laughs> yeah, he's sitting on a chair right now. That's how I'm supporting him. But you can see there's the opening that I would stand through. And then the fake legs would hang off the edge. And um, the robes of the wraith would actually cover a lot of that to help hide and give the good effect. And then I would stand on the, the trash cans and walk. And here's the eye glowing in the reflector and the wigs. But yeah, he was only made out of cardboard and it only took a couple of days to throw together. There he was in the play with the Headless Horseman. Which I may resurrect that one again with the new Sleepy Hollow show coming out. Which, what is it? Oh, is it really? Uh, oh, I guess I'll have to make another one. <laughs> That's good. I'll be able to keep that one then. Oh, here's another interesting side note in terms of film. If you look closely here, and I made these for uh, the film. This is from The Patriot, which was shot here in Carolina a few years ago. And it's along with what I was talking about how in film and TV, one character will have several different versions of the same costume. The reason being, here for instance, he's in one scene where he's running very quickly. And in his regular boots, it wasn't very comfortable. So we created a pair of spats, which you can see if you look very closely, to go over athletic shoes so that he was able to run much more comfortably. And then, you know, we had to, to age these and create them to look like his original pair of boots. And I believe I have a picture of those. No, I may not. But um, again, it goes along with, ah, here's the loom knitting with a Jane hat. These looms are great. I do, and there are a, there are a large variety of really great wig supplies out there. One of the places I like to go to is called Lacey Costume Wig. That's L-A-C-E-Y. They're located in New York, and they supply to a lot of the theatrical houses in New York. They range the gamut from you know cheap costume wigs all the way up to human hair wigs that cost thousands of dollars. And they have a good supply of wigs, but it depends on the character. There are many times where I'm able to find a wig that's exact, and that works well. And then there's sometimes where I'll have to find one that may be close. And then generally you'll go to a, a wig stylist or even a hairstylist and wear your wig and have them cut it to the style that you're looking for while it's on your head. That way you know it looks right for while you're wearing it. But there are times too where you've had where people have to combine several different wigs. Uh, they'll have to, you know, add some things into the wig to make it to make it look the way it's supposed to. So there are quite a few different things you can do in terms of wig wear. And wig work. I would recommend finding one that's as close as you could, and then if you needed to, yes, take it to a stylist. And this time of year, obviously, for ha with Halloween, is great for trying to find wigs. BuyCostumes.com, if anyone's familiar with that company, they have a lot of great wigs in their supply, and they sometimes run $5 wig, wig deals, and I've gotten a lot of wigs from them. 
bycostumes.com. B yeah, B Y C O S T U M E S. I just I will do both of those. Uh, depending on what the jewelry is, sometimes you have to recreate it yourself. Uh, many times you can find it on eBay or Etsy. More and more people these days are doing recreations of jewelry and accessories and weaponry and other things that you can find to go with your costume or whatever the item is you're looking for. Uh, of course, with steampunk these days, too, people are doing a lot of that. There are a lot of steampunk sites out there. So there are many great sites and places that you can go to to look for jewelry and wigs and accessories. That, and I, I do a lot of my shopping online. And many times it's great when you stumble across something in a thrift store or at a store that works perfectly for what you're working on. So, um, and sometimes, again, you have to make things. A groovy slippers for Dorothy. These are basically just a pair of character shoes that are covered with the red glitter fabric. But they sho they're shoes you can get, you know, you get the shoes to fit yourself and then cover them over. Here are, is another picture of the Klingon spines. Let's go show that. Again, for folks that are, in, are in, um, familiar with Star Trek, you know that the Klingon characters had a lot of armor that they wore with their costume. And these were recreated, these were the spine armor pieces that many of the Klingons wore in the show and on the movies. The original one, which you can see over here, was made out of fiberglass. And it was constantly breaking and had to be repaired and glued back together. This one is made out of a type of plastic called Sintra board, and that's S-I-N-T-R-A, which you can buy online. It's a great plastic. It's easy to cut. It's heat moldable, and you can paint it. And I'll be glad to pass this around so you can see what the Sintra board plastic looks like. But we recreated these based on the ones from the, the TV show and the movie for use in the parks and other interactive properties because they were sturdy. They withheld up to a lot of... Um, wear and tear. They didn't break very easily. The center board will break before it bends or bends before it breaks. So it's a very good material to work with in terms of making accessories and armor or jewelry pieces. And it comes in a variety of colors as well. So I'll be glad to pass this around. Here, there are uh, Mel Gibson's actual boots that we had to recreate in, in the spats. Oh, thank you, Kristen. Oh. oh, yes, we did that as well. Um, that's blue. Oh, no, wait, that's cheese, yes. Uh, we recreated some of the puppets from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade a few years ago for their float. And this is one of the puppets that was made out of the, the soft polyfoam that I was talking about earlier and covered with a type of material called fleece that, would, uh, that stitches very well and hides seams. So yeah, we, we did those guys. Uh, if anybody remembers the old Bojangles commercials from a few years ago, we did that chicken guy. Uh, here, I was talking about the armor earlier. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's an old one. It's a scan. But this gentleman here is Ben Burt, who is the sound designer for all the Star Wars films. He's also a Civil War buff, and he directed the film for the S Visitor Center at Manassas a few years ago called Manassas End of Innocence. Well, here, of course, is one of the main performers in the film. And here I am in my stormtrooper, in my biker scout armor. I was actually working on this film, and to surprise Ben one day, showed up in my armor and had a standoff with one of the Civil War guys. <laughs> so, as you can see, folks on uh, movie sets usually do a lot to amuse themselves. Let's see. Okay, here. Here's another use of the EVA foam I was talking about. This was a giant prop quarter that was made from one of the Paramount properties. Uh, it's about 18 inches tall. 
And it's basically the foam was just cut and carved, as you can see here, and then painted. The foam paints great. You generally have to coat it with something like the Pepakura to keep the paint from rubbing off, but it's a really good material to work with in terms of building huge props. And we were talking about um, accessories and shoes. If you need to create a shoe to look like something else, here's the EVA foam. We added a tip to a pair of basically a bedroom slippers and covered them with fabric to create a pair of Arabian looking shoes. Here's some more of the Star Trek accessories. Again, floor matting that was cut and painted, had the strips woven in, and then the insignia made out of the friendly plastic. This was a Romulan costume, if folks are familiar with the Romulan character. Here was a hat made out of that EVA foam to go with the shoes I was showing earlier. This was for an Arabian character. The EVA foam is cut and glued together, covered with fabric, like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then paired with the shoes for the character. So as you can see, you don't even necessarily need to use fabric or, or materials you would necessarily think of for costumes for costumes. I use a lot of cardboard and foam core in, uh, in my props. Oh, and here just for fun, Big Bird. He has about 4,000 feathers on his costume. And another large puppet for folks who may have seen the Muppet Christmas Carol. Here's the ghost of Christmas present. And he is made out of, his head was also made out of foam. And as with many of the Muppets, they're covered with a, not all of them, but some of them are covered with a process called flocking. Is anyone familiar with flocking? You've probably seen wallpaper that looks like that too. Flocking is basically, <coughs> excuse me, thousands of tiny little bristles that are nylon and can be dyed. You coat your base, such as his head there, with a glue, put it in front of an electric plate, turn the electricity on, and the char the the static electricity draws all those thousands of little tiny bristles right onto the face. So you basically have thousands of nylon bristles that are glued onto the face and make it look fuzzy and soft. <coughs> Another one recorder. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I think that may have maybe back to the beginning. <coughs> Sorry. More loom knitting. You can create scarves in the looms. So as you can see, you can make costumes out of a huge variety of materials. You can make them complicated with the, the way they do sometimes in Hollywood, or you can find them at thrift stores, which is one of my favorite techniques. So, and I see I'm getting close to the end. Is that right? A few more minutes. Do I have time for questions? If anybody has any questions or would like to see any of these materials up close? Yes? Do you have a favorite uh, costume or puppet that you worked on? Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think one of my favorite puppets was Trekkie Monster for Avenue Q. Uh, we did the, one of the European tours for Avenue Q a few years ago, and I always loved the show. And that was my favorite character from the show, so I definitely enjoyed working on Trekkie for that one. Other questions or yes? Is there a style that you would like to show yourself costume? You know, it's hard to say. There are so many costumes I would love to make for myself. I do it on my own just for fun, but after you spend a day working on costumes for, for a production and for other people, sewing is sometimes the last thing I want to do when I get home in the evening. So there's there are so many things I would love to make, but I can't really pinpoint just one. I, I really enjoy the process. As I said, cosplay is the, the process of creating your character and costume is, is the process of the technology of creating the costume, and I love to do both. There are some characters that I find that I really have an affinity with that I love to make the costumes for, and then there are times where I'm just looking at a costume thinking, I bet I could put that together and enjoy the challenge of finding the parts and pieces for it and recreating it. So it's, it's a combination of things, but uh, it's definitely a, a fun job. I wouldn't trade it.
there are there are actually a lot of really good resources out online now for things like that. And if you're looking for to create stormtrooper armor specifically, or even just vacuum forming, 501st.com has some great resources. There are also there's also one company that I've done a lot of work with, and they do some fabulous uh, vacuum forming prints. Is Studio Creations does a lot of great vacuum forming stuff. But as you can see, I mean, you created some beautiful armor looking pieces out of you know, resin and other objects, and you could certainly create armor out of that same type of technique. It's, I know a lot of people are daunted by the stormtrooper armor, but it's not as difficult, really, as you, you might think. So. Well, I have very much enjoyed the chance to come talk with everybody. Thank you. And uh, I hope you have a great Halloween and happy costuming and um, enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.